Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect to the elders past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Okay, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Sarah Russell to um, deliver our postgraduate seminar today. So, so Sarah has been really interested in um, um, T cell fate for, for a long time since she started your PhD, um, where she's been looking at signal to transduction pathways um, that, that influence how T cells develop, um, how these vary um, during the different types of um, immunological response. Um, and, and Sarah does, does some really beautiful research that involves always a really nice mix of the cutting edge of, of conceptual biology and, and the integration of advanced imaging technologies, which is where we're all trying to head. So on that note, I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome Sarah to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that sound OK for everyone? Okay, good. It's a bit disconcerting to me. Do, do I need that or no? Okay, good. Um, all right, now I have to confess, I kind of pulled this together at very last minute, so there's probably going to be some hitches in my flow as I go. Um, hopefully that's okay. I, I want to use that as a reason to encourage you all to muddle along with me, ask questions, tell me if I'm not making sense. So if you could please interrupt at any stage, I'd be delighted. I gather that there's five questions questions that have to be asked, so feel free to get them out of the way early. Um, okay, now, I, I, I was just saying to Sam, I'm not sure how deeply you guys want me to go into principles of developmental biology compared to jumping into my T-cell stuff, so, so I've started very broadly, but I'll hone in on the T-cell work reasonably fast. But I put this first slide up just to make the point that uh, there really is an awful lot in common between developmental systems, whether we're talking about immunology or botany, and um, it's well worth uh, looking at examples from other organisms to learn best about um, the principles in the cell system that you might be interested in. And I've been lucky to be exposed to a lot of um, developmental biologists that um, use Drosophila as a model organism and many other sorts of systems, and that certainly has guided my thinking over the years a lot. Um, and I've tried to throw in a few of the principles that more broadly um, relate to developmental biology as I go. I went back and looked at this slide at the just just ten minutes ago and realised that I probably haven't done it as much as I ought to. So I'll try and remember to link in these principles as we go because I didn't kind of specifically highlight them in the slides. But um, so so we we will talk today about what controls T cell fate in at uh, two levels. One is during development and the other is following activation, and we'll get into the specifics of that later. But as I say, uh, I'm very interested in similarities between uh, T-cell fate control and other developmental systems. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the idea of how do we understand the balance between three different sorts of factors that dictate T-cell fate, uh, which are programming, how much of the uh, cell fate is predetermined, extrinsic factors, what comes from the outside to tell the T-cell, what diff developmental different direction it should go in, and stochasticity, what sort of random um, occurrences, like, for instance, the balance between two transcription factors that are just stochastically regulated within the cell, uh, impact on the behaviour of the cells as they progress along these differentiation pathways. And um, a lot of the time we tend to think, because it's easier, about binary fate choices, and I think we're learning more and more, and I'm sure you'll hear about this a lot over the course of your... Um, series uh, of talks this year, um, that there's actually, a, a, generally, that's too simplistic. And in fact, there's a spectrum of fate choices. And we really should be thinking more about, you know, where the cell lands along that spectrum rather than making this choice between X or Y. And there's also uh, a temptation often to think about ma master regulators and to decree that one particular influence is, is the determining factor in a differentiation choice. And most likely, um, 
there's actually a combination of many factors and they're all sort of nudging the cells in different directions and quite possibly it's your experimental setup that's actually uh, kind of disguising some of the other nudges to make it look like you're, you're just uh, uh, seeing one master regulator. So um, we try to sort of stop and think about what what is in our experimental context that might be disguising some of the other fate determinants as we go and, and it tends to make us stop and realise that actually things are not quite as explicit as we might have thought looking at the data at first. And I just wanted to introduce the idea of Waddington's landscape. Has anyone talked about this in your seminars so far? No? Um, but possibly undergraduate, this is a very uh, fundamental idea that helps to guide thinking in, in uh, understanding the uh, mechanisms by which uh, differentiation is controlled in a lot of systems. And so Conrad Waddington uh, wrote a book in 1957 where he drew this picture um, and it's been um, replicated thousands of times in many reviews and talks over the years and um, it basically symbolises a cell that is um, moving down this uh, contoured hill in ways that uh, guide uh, decisions that it will make. So, for instance, here this sort of represents a binary fate choice where a cell can either go this way or this way and it'll sort of hover up here and various... Um, uh, uh, context-dependent um, decision-making uh, behaviours will determine whether it tips that way or that way, but it's basically got to give, to give one or the other. So the implication here is there's a sort of uni unidirectional process, as in the cell doesn't go backwards up here, um, and there's a sort of energy-dependent guide as to what sort of choices a, a cell will make. And it is a very useful concept for lots of things. It's actually... I think people have tried to kind of model it and apply uh, rules based on this concept and of course they don't quite work because there are a lot of principles that you sort of implicitly think about here, like gravity causing it to head in one direction, which, you know, aren't, aren't relevant to biology. Um, but, but it certainly is a helpful guide to thinking about and, and it has been used in a lot of the basis of um, understanding differentiation. And then another concept that's kind of important to think about is the difference between cell potential, cell fate, and cell state. Um, so the cell potential, you know, a multipotent stem cell has the capacity to um, adopt many different fates, um, many different differentiation pathways. It then kind of... Uh, can be allocated a fate which starts to compress which of those pathways it can undertake. So at any given stage in a cell's development, you can consider that its fate is the restriction of potential that, you know, dictates that it can, it can only go in certain directions. And this is, this is both guided by and contributes to the cell state, which is basically the, the cell phenotype, the, um, uh, level of expression of transcription factors and cell surface markers and and um, functional traits that that define whether it is, for instance, in my case, often an effector T cell or a memory T cell or you know any other neuro neuron or whatever else you might be thinking of. So these things tend to be thought of differently, and the definitions are a little bit different depending on who you talk to, but you kind of have to have your own perception of how they all link together and what, what you're meaning when you talk about these sorts of things to, to really be able to um, articulate a particular or understand a particular sort of uh, differentiation pathway. And then I like to think about the different components that influence fate using these kinds of schematics. So, so we all know that there are genetic components which create some sort of intrinsic determinant of uh, the, the capacity of a cell to, to um, differentiate down different pathways. And um, so, you know, of course, your genome will allow all the different fate pathways, but then you get epigenetic modifications and so on, which will create an intrinsic uh, 
different sort of potential, so, so will dictate fate to a certain amount. And then there are many extrinsic factors, growth factors, cytokines, all kinds of, you know, contact with other cells, all kinds of different things that will uh, add to the, uh, the network of, of guides that will control cell fate. And, and these intrinsic and extrinsic components will combine to provide some sort of um, determinism to the, the cell fate differentiation. And then there's an, the other component that I mentioned before, stochastic um, activity. So, you know, if a, cell, if, a, if a cell's got fluctuating levels of a cytokine receptor, then it will respond differently to uh, ex, the extrinsic cue that might otherwise be influencing its fate. And the, the program will be... Uh, will sort of chug along, but then the stochastic influences will then influence the program differently. So you basically get this combination between the deterministic factors and the stochastic factors that combine to, to reprogram the cell. And the main point here is really that there's, at any given time, there's a set amount that is programmed within the cell, but that programming is not absolute because there are still continual changes to the cell phenotype which impacts on its likely programming. And some sorts of programming is, is very strong and very stable and other sorts of programming is, is much weaker and much more transient. So um, you have to sort of factor all of that into thinking about the, the, the impact of these different attributes. And that sounds a bit waffly, I'm sure, was that a hand up for a question or no? Um, um, uh, and I tend to feel there's a there's a time for being a bit anthropomorphic in thinking about your cells, and this is one of them. Um, so that idea that you've got these sort of short and long term programs that can be influenced by external events is not really that different than you know when you're thinking about a school kid who's got certain amount of potential, but then there's certain amount of extrinsic influences that can impact on that potential, and it can look like they're heading in a particular uh, direction and then some other extrinsic or stochastic factor might change and trigger them to go down a different direction and so you know they might be a carpenter or they might be a judge and you know they they start off multipotent but then they their fate um, gets steadily more and more restricted uh, you, but but still is changeable and so that's really what happens in every cell as far as I'm concerned there's far it you know there's a lot of flexibility always um, now um, I was procrastinating this morning when I was writing this talk I was checking my Twitter feed and Shal and Nate uh, tweeted this repost of a paper from cell in 2014 which I thought was actually quite relevant so I spent some time chucking it into the talk to Avoid doing the hard work. Um, so, so in many ways, you know, the idea of this paper was that we need to stop just thinking about the genome and think about all the other ohms, and then we'll understand biology much better. But where I kind of feel it comes into these concepts is that, in many ways, I, I didn't read the paper, so I'm not entirely sure what they meant by phenome, but to me it's cell state. Um, and um, so if you think of that as the sort of final outcome, uh, the differentiation state of a cell at any given time, um, then I think there are extrinsic factors that can influence that are the physiome. Again, I'm not entirely sure what they mean by physiome, but it seems, seems to me it fits in there. The, Anatome, I guess, you know, cell position within the organism is, is highly relevant to uh, the extrinsic influences that it's going to get. Microbiome also, and I guess expososome probably means all the other stuff that feeds into things. So they're the extrinsic factors. Um, and then the sort of the, the um, aspects that have variable amounts of deterministic influence would be the genome, of course, the transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome, and the epigenome. Um, and then, of course, you've got your stochastic stuff chucked in there to make all kinds of changes as well. But it, I, I guess it also makes the point that it's not, again, it's not a one-way street. So, you know, as you... Uh, 
change the transcriptome, that feeds into the metabolome, which changes the behaviour of the cell, which impacts on the proteome, and that then, you know, feeds back into the epigenome, potentially. So there are all these multi-staged interactive processes that combine to, um, to decree uh, how the cell's going to differentiate. And I think we do need to think of them all as we're going along. Um, so then if we think back to that sort of idea of the phenome as the cell state, um, we, we really can't understand differentiation until we've properly catalogued uh, the sorts of fates that a cell can adopt. And we have been wonderful at, at doing this kind of defining cell states for many, many decades and um, have contributed to these sorts of profiles of, uh, you know, what you expect, what sort of hierarchy of fate decisions you can expect to see. And uh, this one I just pulled out of Wikipedia, and it's a very simplistic, basic one. Uh, but, of course, you all know there are thousands of these sorts of schematics floating around. And you also would all know that they are very useful, but always highly flawed, because there's always more to the story than what you see here, and there's always um, problems with, uh, you know, assuming that you really can identify, a, you know, well, in these cases, they're all pretty easy to separate out, but, you know, do you really have the capacity to, to um, put your cells into these particular boxes? Um, now, that's been done a lot with cell surface profiling, and that's, of course, got more and more sophisticated with things like transcriptomics and cytov. So, whereas at the beginning you'd use morphology or maybe one or two markers, now we can be far more sophisticated about this sort of cataloging. Um, as I said, you know, there's, there's dangers with stereotyping that, you know, you might be wrong that your markers actually cover two different sorts of fate decisions, not just one, um, and that's, you know, again, there's a sort of anthropomorphic uh, notion here that, you know, we really have to be very careful about assuming from particular markers that we can judge the behaviour of a group and so on. Um, we have got better and better at this, as I say, um, using different sorts of clustering, using the sort of multiplexed approaches that are now available and then getting better and better at clustering them. And just one illustration of how that's kind of improved our thinking about differentiation is that we now can move from these sort of very discrete cell populations into a, 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 an understanding of a you know, cells progressing along a continuum of cell states and um, there's still binary choices here, but um, it's kind of easier to understand them if you if you think about uh, the, the differentiation as being along a continuum rather than sort of jumping from one group to another. And I think, you know, we'll start, uh, we already see often now examples where there can be, you know, backsliding and all kinds of different uh, behaviours that... Um, make even this sort of schematic not not quite fully representing the entire biology. So that's all been very useful, the cataloging idea for understanding what fate decisions are made. And then the other thing that I think is um, becoming more and more valuable in understanding differentiation is, is what I sort of overall term genealogy. Uh, so understanding the ancestry of cells to better understand how they... Um, um, better understand how they uh, um, uh, differentiate. So uh, there's been a huge amount of work done using sort of approaches like single cell purification where you transplant cells, for instance, a stem cell, and you see what it can give rise to and so on. That's a wonderful tool, has really transformed our understanding. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, the points that I want to make throughout this talk is that no technique is is 100% perfect and really, you know, you, you need to understand the flaws in all. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means that probably you need to attack something from three different directions before you can fully believe the results that you're getting. And certainly with single cell uh, transplantation, um, of course, the very process of transplantation can seriously impact on the fate decisions that a cell m makes, and that's, that's certainly something that's... Um, of growing concern for people who work on those sorts of things. Um, 
Simil whoops, sorry. Similarly, once you've got your single cells, you can learn a lot by doing in vitro cultures. Um, there are methods that have been used in, for instance, Drosophila for a long time to mark individual clones within a cell. And this is one example of a twin spot uh, mark M system where you can actually track the two daughters of a dividing cell and get a good idea of by following the cells with over time to um, uh, understand what you know the heritage of each each of the daughters and we're getting better and better at doing that in mammalian systems as well so either barcoding which I'm sure you've all heard of or or fluorescent tagging of the cells with different colors rainbow or confetti are the sort of two most common examples of that um, so there are ways now to track the 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 genealogy of the cells actually in in organisms um, and then there's just watching the process over time and again uh, C. elegans has been a classic for doing that kind of work forever and uh, Drosophila similarly has been very valuable in just being able to actually you know just see over time how cells uh, yield progeny that have particular fates um, we can do a lot of that now in organoids and in in vitro surrogates in in mammals um, and heading towards being able to do short term aspects of this in in mice for instance but um, we've probably got a long way to go before we can actually track an entire pedigree in 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 a in a complex organism such as a mouse but we can certainly by pooling different aspects of these sorts of approaches we can we can now learn a lot um so um, the, the main messages from that, uh, just sort of to reiterate a bit what I talked about before, is we, need, we, we can see that uh, these different uh, inputs into fate determination can have very uh, uh, different durations of impact. So sometimes seconds, you know, a transcription factor can be around for a very short period of time. It'll either react or not, and then um, it'll probably the levels of it will change. Um, so these the, these can influence the cell state. The uh, um, actually, I'm not quite sure what I meant to say there. Let's ignore that. Uh, epigenetic. Uh, modifications, metabolomic programming, and so on. Congruent, congruence of events is a very important thing that's actually very hard to track, but uh, just an example of this is that an extrinsic impact only has impact if it coincides with, uh, you know, the signaling pathway being receptive to that extrinsic input, which often is very regulated by um, lots of changes in transcription factors and so on. Um, the relative dominance of these inputs is hard to define and very changeable with time and in different contexts and so on. Um, and the other aspect that can really influence how these uh, different inputs impact uh, over an entire pedigree is the um, very uh, critical moment of transmission of the um, um, modifiers to the two daughters and I'll come back to that a little bit later in terms of asymmetric cell division but um, you know really there's all kinds of things the time at which a cell divides uh, can impact a lot on the behavior of the two daughters um, there's a lot of stochastic distribution of components between the two daughters which can impact and um, and then there's the aspect of asymmetric cell division as well so all of these things converge to um, di dictate T-cell fate. And we've been thinking about that in two different aspects of T-cell biology, as I mentioned. The first is T-cell development, um, a particular process called beta selection, which is of interest because it's a very abrupt fate transition. Um, the choices that the cell makes are really between self-renewal and death and progression along one particular differentiation pathway. Um, so I'll go back to that in a minute. Uh, the other one that I'll um, spend a bit of time on is T-cell activation. So here we're talking about uh, the rate and extent of expansion of a T-cell after it's been been uh, activated by uh, contact with an antigen presenting cell and also a fate choice between effector and memory differentiation. And we do this kind of work with in vitro cell tracking. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we um, try to link this up with work on mouse models where we do the standard kind of knockout approach, see what genes are important for particular uh, fate decisions and so on. Lots of mathematical modeling to try and get a sense for uh, how, um, how, for instance, proliferation can impact on, on uh, 
growth of one particular cell versus another and things like that, and in situ staining to um, actually see what's going on in the mouse. Um, so thymocyte fate determination, uh, T-cell development, as, as I said, we're talking about beta selection or the T-cell receptor beta checkpoint, which is the stage of the cell where the cell first expresses a recombined T-cell receptor. And um, it has to make sure that it's got that right and it has to balance... Um, uh, while it's actually recombining that T-cell receptor, it's got to balance risks of uh, inappropriate homologous recombination of the genome at that time. So it's got to check that it's, uh, you know, it's not damaged at the end of that process. So uh, as I mentioned, that, that then means that there's a, a very dramatic phenotypic shift. The cell changes its expression of all kinds of different factors as it progresses through this checkpoint from DN3A to DN4. Um, and... Um, as, a, as it goes along that, that way, it changes its cell cycle conditions, its survival dependency, its capacity for proliferation. Um, and so we're interested in you know, why the cell does divide at this very dangerous time. Um, how is self-renewal, which we know to occur at this point, enabled and restricted? What determines the fate choices in terms of the molecules and the, the extrinsic inputs? Um, and I won't go into it now, but uh, we're also interested, sorry, in, in how it, it goes wrong in leukemia and, and how we can actually make better use of this process for therapeutic uh, development of T cells. So we know that um, at this particular stage, the DN3A cell is interacting with a stromal cell in the, in the thymus that presents... Um, Notch, notch, sorry, these are flipped the wrong way, notch ligands to the notch receptor on the T cell. And we know, that, as I said, that it recombines the T cell receptor and it expresses this on the surface and it assesses its capacity for signaling before it's allowed to sort of go, go ahead with survival and differentiation and proliferation at this point. Uh, we know it needs IL-7 receptor, but I'm not going to dwell on that today. And we know it needs a particular chemokine that uh, signals through the CXCR4 chemokine receptor. Um, and as I said, it, it needs self-renewal as well. So we've been interested in how all these cues actually... Um, feed into each other to tell the T cell when it's ready to kick off it, all these new processes of differentiation and proliferation. And um, we showed two or three years ago that as the cell um, interacts with the stromal cell, as the, the DN3A cell interacts with the stromal cell, it divides at this DN3A stage in an asymmetric manner. So the two daughters inherit quite dramatically different components from the cell. And um, we know that impacts on fate, we don't yet know exactly how each daughter adopts a different fate. Uh, we just know that overall, if you disrupt asymmetric cell division, you, you lose the sort of normal uh, differentiation progression. So um, we've been looking at this, this system using, uh, a, 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 as I said, an in vitro surrogate where um, it's a very well characterized system where you can push the cells through pretty much the entire process of T-cell differentiation in vitro using this OP9 uh, bone marrow-derived stromal cell line expressing the notch ligand. And um, at Swinburne, we make these microfabricated cell paddocks that allow us to keep the cells within the field of view over a long period of time, and um, we can then... Um, uh, look at the pedigrees of the cells as they come through. Now, I'm not going to mention the pedigrees of these now, and in fact, I think I'm already running out of time, so I'll, I'll skip through this because it's published, but we've um, used these systems to actually um, sort through what it is that actually controls asymmetric cell division and, and the um, subsequent biology of the thymocytes, and um, we've we've been able to plug in various aspects of uh, chemokine regulation and the, the polarity components within the cell that, that dictate this kind of cell, um, cell differentiation process. Um, 
and um, we've been looking at how self-renewal of the cells might impact, and I'm going to jump through that because I don't think we've got time for it today, but we've used several methods of, um, of um, knockout mice and cells derived from knockout mice and looking at how the asymmetry at the time of division impacts on the proliferation of the cells and other aspects of its differentiation um, to get to a model where we can start to... Um, ascribe different fates to the two daughters of the asymmetrically divided um, um, DN3A cell. And um, we are now at the point where we're actually collecting up pedigrees from this to, to sift through it. But I'm not going to dwell on that now because, uh, sorry, I have really mucked up my... Yes, OK. So, uh, sorry, it's all very um, confused at this point. I should have been more careful with these slides. But anyway, here are some examples of the pedigrees that we get from these, these um, developing thymocytes. And you can see that in some instances, they just sit quietly for up to 44, five hours, even though that their siblings can continue to divide a couple of times over that process. So we're starting to be able to pull out these self-renewing cells and hope to be able to look at what, what molecules they inherit that are different from the others that tell them to self-renew at this, at this stage. Um, so the plan is to use this process of time-lapse imaging and pedigree de de uh, differentiation um, to um, start to sift through what happens at each generation in these cells. Um, and um, we've started uh, integrating the different molecular signals to um, understand which ones influence these different components within the cell. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. I'm very sorry. Um, I think I, uh, yeah, I think I'll just cut to the chase, which is that we now we now have worked out that all those components that seem to be different actually assemble towards something that is a really a surrogate for an immunological synapse that interacts with the stromal cell here to uh, coordinate the signals from all these different it, different inputs. And um, by assembling like this, we, we feel that there's probably a much more coherent um, uh, instruction to the cell from here, and we're now, we're now trying to sort of pull out exactly what that means in terms of the, the pedigree differentiation. So, sorry, that was, that was very fluffy. I'll try and do better in the T-cell differentiation part. But um, what, what we know from this is that DN3A cells are the ones that start their recomb recombining, and they do seem to have two very different daughters, one of which seems to be um, set up for self-renewal and the other one which then progresses to a DN3B undergoes symmetric cell division and then can yield a, a large number of uh, progeny that go through subsequent differentiation steps. And this self-renewal stage probably occurs once or twice and then the cells kind of peter out and we think that's probably quite similar to the Drosophila neuroblast system where... Um, the cells have a kind of molecular timer that says you can divide a couple of times, but no more. Um, so that's it for T-cell development. Now we'll go on to T-cell activation. Um, and just to quickly rush through the concepts here, um, there's been a question for a very long time about how we know that the cells expand massively once they've been activated by antigen presentation. We know that most of them are effector cells, but... Uh, at a certain point, the effector cells all die and memory cells arise from what's left in this population. And we know from a lot of work that's been done by many people uh, using the sorts of um, uh, single cell uh, transplantation and lineage tracing approaches that one clone can produce both effector and memory cells. And we know that there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the proportion of effector and memory and the size of the response. But there's still an awful lot not known, including, for instance, you go from naive to effector or memory, or do you go from naive to memory to effector, or do you split right at the beginning and choose one fate or the other? Um, is the variability determined or stochastic? And if it is determined, at what stage is determined? And I think I showed this a couple of years ago when I gave one of these um, PhD uh, talks. And um, uh, it's still actually very relevant today. Um, but uh, this one was authored by Phil Hodgkin, and it was basically to argue uh, with Steve Reiner, who um, with us first identified 
uh, that T cells uh, did undergo asymmetric cell division, or that naive T cells did undergo asymmetric cell division. And so Steve Reiner has been pushing for, a, 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 since that time, an idea that there is a very deterministic process here where once the cells divided asymmetrically, one of the cells is destined to become a memory cell and the other is destined to become an affected cell. And uh, that's caused a lot of controversy in the field um, and Phil Hodgkin is one of the people or groups that have been uh, quite determined that that is not actually how things work. And um, certainly I, I've been kind of sitting in the middle and in some ways I still am sitting in the middle um, and I'll tell you a bit about where my thinking is on that as, as we go. But yeah, so this is basically the summary of that sort of idea which was illustrated um, in this paper that you you have a very deterministic process of asymmetric inheritance of fate determinants of uh, this first division of the naive T cell and one cell then um, doesn't proliferate um, or at least not much and uh, is destined to be memory whereas the other takes the adopter fate. So we again used a process of in vitro um, uh, imaging of these cells over the couple of weeks that it takes for a cell to be stimulated by an antigen presenting cell and undergo the contraction and uh, the sorry expansion and contraction that is a normal part of this immune response. Um, and we can see the cell divide and divide again and then divide again. And um, you can see here that basically it's pretty much impossible to track them after a small amount of time. So we micro pipette them into new paddocks and keep the tracking going. And so this way we can actually assemble pedigrees from these cells. And uh, we built some um, uh, software to be able to, to uh, incorporate the traces of the cells into pedigrees and um, collect up all the information about cell size and fluorescence and whatever else we felt was useful into these pedigrees. And we've used that to interrogate these pedigrees for quite some time now. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of a snapshot of what we've learned from them. Um, first thing we can do um, is actually just look at the expansion contraction profiles for individual clones. Um, and you can see here that over time they... they um, expand more or less exponentially and then at a certain point they start to reduce and there's a lot of variation as you would imagine, expect and hope uh, between different clones within this. And you can kind of imagine what, how they'd each contribute to a, a population type expansion by looking at over time uh, uh, how much of the total from, in this case, 16 merged clones is uh, contributed by each. And you can see that, for instance, at a certain point, um, one clone is the dominant one, but then that tends to be taken over by another and then another. And so, you know, it's not like there's one consistently dominating over the others. Um, oh, but, sorry. Um, so... Um, this is this kind of degree of heterogeneity is is what's been seen in vivo long ago, and so we hope that what we're doing is mimicking that sort of contribution from individual clones here. And um, then you can um, uh, see that um, because we actually know about each cell within these pedigrees, you can actually look at things like the lifespan of cells across, over time. So here we've just taken from all the pedigrees, we've looked at what their lifespan is over different generations. And the first one has a long lifespan of well over a day because it takes a long time for the cells to be activated and so on. Then you have this very uniform um, cell cycle times over the first, the next few generations, and then you suddenly get this divergence of, of uh, lifespans. Now here we we've, we've see, start to see by generation five that some of the cells are dividing, and they're the ones that are colored blue in here, or in the blue, in, uh, in represented by the blue violin plot. And some of them actually lived for so long that we, could, we lost track of them, and so we don't know whether they died or, or divided again at this point, but they lived, you know, for two or three days. So we certainly don't think of them as, you know, they're, they're interesting cells that have contributed to the pedigree in certain ways. But what's particularly interesting here is they were so uniform till generation five, and then suddenly everything started to go crazy. Um, 
and uh, possibly I'll skip this in the interests of time. Um, but we we then took these pedigrees, and because they're more or less complete, there's a little tail missing there, but we felt that we could actually now, for the first time, uh, put numbers to the, the quality of uh, these uh, immune responses. So you can see the peak height, you can see the timing at which it peaks. You know, some of them take a while to get to their maximum uh, expansion. Some of them um, uh, can do it faster. And then uh, that timing, of course, is is impacted by the onset of contraction. And then the whole thing is encompassed in the area uh, under the curve, which tells you something about the durability of the response as well as the... the um, extent of it. So these all correlate a bit with each other, um, so we feel they're sort of three useful numbers that quantify the entire process of the peak, and we've been using that to try and get an understanding of, um, of uh, whether you can actually predict that kind of immune response by looking at characteristics early in the cell, because of course we also have been able to measure all kinds of characteristics of, of the founder cell and the cells along the way. So if you measure the size of the founder cell um, right at the beginning, before it's even met its antigen-presenting cell, it shows remarkable correlation with the peak height and the peak timing and the area under the curve, particularly the area under the curve, which is probably the sort of, you know, the overall um, uh, quality of the immune response. So this was very surprising to us that that you already have determined so much about the immune response before you've even met an antigen presenting cell. Now I should reiterate, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, experimental context decrees uh, a lot of what you can see in your experiments here, and we've very carefully um, made these cells. Uh, so that they, they don't see differences in extrinsic responses. So whereas in a normal immune response, you probably get some cells that get less of an activation hit and so on, uh, ours all are in very uniform conditions. So that's given us the chance to then reveal things about, about um, um, how the, the fate can be um, determined early on. But we weren't at all expecting that we would see such a profound um, impact at this level, we assume there'd be far more stochastic influence or um, influence from, say, you know, how how many cells the the um, clones were in contact with at particular times and so on. So um, from this, we we feel that there's there certainly is, as I say, we don't know what's going on in terms of extrinsic factors in in other circumstances, but there is a strong capacity for predetermining right at the beginning. How the shape of the immune response can be can be will will uh, evolve. Um, the next question that we were interested in was how do fates, fates diverge? Sorry, within the clones. So um, in in the system that we used, we actually took the two daughters of that first naive cell and put them into separate paddocks so that we'd be able to quantify their immune responses over time. And this is the comparison of the siblings. And you can see that they actually, each sibling was remarkably similar in many ways. Look at this incredible overlay of the two different um, profiles and similarly here and in a lot of others. Now there's certainly somewhere there's some asymmetry in the sibling response, but the, the dominant behaviour seems to be um, similarity between the two siblings. And this raises the issue, maybe some of you are saying, you know, what she's saying here, how do you know, how do you, how do you decide whether this is mostly symmetric or mostly asymmetric and so on. And that's something that we've been really working hard on and are progressing towards is being able to quantify these sorts of asymmetries. Another way of looking at it is just to, to look at the shape of the pedigrees once you've created them. And here's one that looks extremely uniform, the, the top half seems to look very much the same as the bottom half in this. Sorry, my representations are all different, but in this one, uh, the the left looks very different from the right. So um, um, you'd have to consider this asymmetric to some degree, but again, how do you quantify to be able to sort of make assessments about all the different pedigrees? And this is something that I've been... Uh, concerned with for a long time um, and started to work with Damien Hicks and Terry Speed to, um, to for them to develop, not me because I'm no mathematician, um, uh, systems to actually quantify that, that um, 
that sort of idea. So yeah, that's basically summarised there. Um, but just uh, before we sort of go into the quantification, I want to just say that this, the, these data that we've got now, even though, you know, in some ways we're sort of looking at them quite subjectively, there is no question that they, they basically totally debunk the, the Reiner type, very black and white approach of an immediate adoption of a memory uh, fate uh, after that first division, because, you know, these cells are still dividing rapidly for at least four or five generations before they're even coming close to doing the sorts of things that, um, that, that reflect a memory state. And just to dwell on that a little bit more, um, in our system, there's no, no, no crisp, clear way to be sure that what we're looking at is, is a memory cell. Um, there's really, that's very hard to do in any system, but um, there are lots of, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, there's sort of lots of surrogate markers of memory and lots of ideas about how you can um, be certain that a cell is a memory cell. Um, and the best we can do in our system is basically use three characteristics of the cells within the pedigrees. So one is it's, it's quite well established that memory cells are smaller than effector cells at the end point of the uh, uh, clonal expansion process. Um, memory cells have um, higher CD62L or L-selectin expression, and of course memory cells divide more slowly than do the effector cells. So if we look, this is one pedigree, one of the more asymmetric pedigrees that, that we pulled out, and if we plot all those things just to get a sense for whether these cells are starting to at least smell like memory. You can see here that the size of the circles represents the size of the cell. So these guys up here are smaller than these guys down here. The positioning on the x-axis relative to the colouring of the cells tells you something about how much they've been dividing, how, how long they've taken to divide. Um, and the CD62L expression is on the y-axis, so is the height of these. So you can start to get a sense here that there's a cluster of cells. They're all uh, circled in black, which tells you that they all came from one of the daughters in this uh, of the generation two. Uh, large, and they're all proliferating quite rapidly, which is why they've already become generation nine at this point. Uh, and they're all really reasonably low for CD62L. So that's all reflections of effector type characteristics. Whereas these guys at the top here are smaller, they're higher for CD62L, and they've taken longer in terms of generations to get to this point. So at, at this particular time point, they're only generation uh, six, seven. Um, so we think maybe there's something there that by multiplexing all these different approaches, we might be able to um, get a, um, a sense for whether cells are heading down the memory pathway or the effector pathway. Um, and I mentioned this paper, which... So I was asked to give a give a paper that would be relevant to people writing a report on... I don't know whether anybody's... Um, read that paper. It's actually not all that relevant to my talk, but it is sort of relevant in this point because it, it focuses on CD62L. So I'll just chuck that in there. Apologies for not giving a, a more useful paper for this, this talk. Um, so um, what we think here is that uh, we're not just looking at the expansion and contraction profiles, but we're getting a sense for memory cell differentiation in here. And I've already went gone through this idea of small cell size, high 62L and so on. So we're now exploring how far we can go in assessing differentiation in these pedigrees. Can we quantify this kind of commitment to memory by using multiple different attributes of the cells? Can we quantify phenotypic variants within the pedigrees just of one particular phenotype, like cell size and so on, which I'll give you a couple of slides on. Uh, and can we use this information to quantify commitment to particular fates as the clone develops? So can we start to ascribe um, uh, determinism in this context? So I'm not going to talk about this paper, but I'm very excited about it. So this is a paper that was driven by Damien Hicks, and it's basically setting up an entirely new statistical approach to, to these ideas of quantifying variation within the uh, within the pedigrees. And um, Damien... Um, 
applied this to our T cell data, some worm pedigrees and some simulated data that is a standard branching process and used particular phenotypes within these different pedigrees to then sort of plug in uh, information that, that then leads to, in the end, um, an opportunity to quantify the, the contribution at each generation to the variance in later generations for particular pedigrees. And the take-home message really is down here. So now we're talking here about uh, contributions to generation six uh, cell size. So it's one very small aspect of these pedigrees. How much can you expect to be um, decreed at different earlier generations that will dictate whether the cell size at generation six is larger or smaller? And nearly all the contribution is from the first generation. So that kind of fits with um, what we'd seen in terms of the, the idea that um, uh, fate is determined in that first naive cells when we were looking at the, the expansion contraction profiles, we now see that size of the cells at generation five is also in, almost entirely determined by the naive cell at the beginning. There's very little room for any changes to occur downstream of that. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, and um, the point, the point what we've mostly learned from looking at these pedigrees is that um, the fate changes are not observable until about generation five. So I'd actually, when I was first making these schematics, I'd got bored with uh, recreating cells at generation five. But that's actually where things are interesting, so I'm going to have to go back and start uh, making more complex schematics now. These ones just aren't complicated enough for the immunology we're looking at. But anyway, so fate changes are observable here, but they're programmed way up here. So you don't see what's different about... Well, maybe you do see a little bit with the cell size, but uh, there's other aspects such as lifespan, which are not the, the, the fates that you see down here are absolutely not observable early on. But there's something going on within those cells that's actually dictating what, what they're, how they're going to behave five generations later. Most of the cells uh, are symmetric. There's a few of them that are asymmetric, maybe 10 or 20%. That actually matches with what we saw molecularly when we, we and others first characterised asymmetric asymmetric cell division in the T cells. So probably a minority of the cells do undergo asymmetric cell division and that might cause um, fate decisions to be different within those cells, but the majority of the cells, at least in the systems that have been looking at so far, are symmetric. All of them go through an effector phase and I mentioned the paper that, that um, I suggested as reading material before that, that absolutely also shows that uh, cells all undergo this effector differentiation and then they de-differentiate before they can become memory cells. Um, and they all, all alter these different aspects of phenotype, cell size, cell cycle, and CD6 to CD62L at this Gen 5 level. Um, but as I said, the programming of the cell cycle and size at least occurs at generation one. Um, so I'll stop there and just mention the people that did the work. Some of them are pictured here and I think I had their names on the slides as I went. Um, so I, I won't list them all now, but thank Damien Hicks and Terry Speed who contributed to the, um, or drove the um, statistical analysis that we hope is going to prove really powerful in dissecting further these phenotypes. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thank you, Sarah, for that um, excellent talk. Um, so before we get into the questions, <coughs> um, I'd like to say, just to remind the students, so there'll be an opportunity to have lunch with Sarah um, in the boardroom after this talk. Okay, so there are, I think first we'll go with the students. So there's five students who have to ask questions. Um, my eyes are bad, these lights don't help the situation, so please, if you're one of the five, shout your name out so I can just cross you off. Please, front right. Yeah, so my name's Anthony. Um, when you were talking about the cell size and the, um, how it relates to the, the size of the immune response, why do you think that is the case? I'm not sure if you... No, I didn't explain it at all. Um, and so... Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of work done, and Phil Hodgkin's group have been some that have shown that the sort of the capacity to yield several generations of proliferating cells is, is 
you know, makes sense that if you're bigger, you've got more material to work with, you can, you can go seven generations or five. So it might be as simple as that. It looks as if the growth rate also uh, is higher in those cells. So they're not just bigger, but they also grow faster. We haven't quite um, sorted through all of that, but that might mean that the cell size actually is an indicator that they're already metabolically different, and maybe that's got something to do with it. So we'll tweak the experiments to understand that better soon. Hi. Uh, hi, Sarah. So do you know what the relative contributions of different molecules are on In our systems? Or, well, yeah, so no. Uh, I mean, that's a really hard question. Um, because, it, you, so you can delete a molecule, and so we have, for instance, deleted scribble and looked at how that impacts on the expansion and differentiation of the cells in our systems, which we then relate to asymmetric cell division. You can do the same with transcription factors and so on. And there's plenty that's been done on that to show what, what transcription factors are necessary for particular differentiation pathways. But that doesn't tell you how they work together to contribute. I don't think anyone's really got the systems to, to define that yet. In terms of reactivating an immune response from a memory population, do those memory cells move to an effector state and then a new memory population is formed, or is it the original memory population that... Um, so, I guess that's the idea that they 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 can revert back to memory again. Whether you'd say it's exactly the same as the first, I don't I don't know um, whether there's differences at that point. Phenotypic differences, I think that's what you're asking in the two sorts of memory populations. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a second, like if the first memory population. Uh, all become effective, or you form a brand new memory population? Yes, no, so you will form a brand new memory population from those, yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alan. Um, apologies if I missed this during your talk, but I was just wondering with asymmetric cell division in general, um, are the products of that asymmetric division always the same, or do you see some randomness? Like, yeah. There's, there's, so there's some systems where they're, you know, it's very stereotypical. You know, you're going to get two daughters that have particular characteristics at the end of it. C. elegans zygote division is is like that. Uh, but then there's others, say a, a sensory organ precursor in a fly, where um, it's completely context dependent how the two daughters will will behave subsequent to that asymmetric cell division. So the process is similar, but the outcome is different. So, yeah, there's all kinds of different scenarios that can occur. I'm Lachlan. Um, so I was confused about the origin of effect versus memory. Uh, was the data showing that uh, these different lineages arrived, arised early after T-cell activation? Or um, does one go, does effect go into memory? So, yeah, you're confused because we still don't know to some extent. Um, so, uh, partly because we, in our system, can't quite characterise what is a memory. So, we can't yet work back from that to say, you know, was that decreed, say, in the first daughter or in the naive cell? Um, so, yeah, I think I think what we know is that um, the, 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 if, if the expansion defines an effector cell, well, they all have to go into effector cell, and then we don't yet know whether there's some kind of stochastic decision that means some of them then are able to become memory after that, or whether that was set right at the beginning. That's, that's a key question that we're not able to answer yet. Um, asymmetrical cell division at beta selection, like what happens to the cell from the other cells? Do they have the potential to like rearrange their TCR and then try and force their way through beta selection? Or? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, we, so, so what we need to be able to do is actually sequence the genome, the, all the, T, the recombined T cell receptor at those stages to know. There's, there's a couple of theories. So one would be that 
you want, you want several copies of a particular rearranged beta chain so that you can match it with different copies of a subsequently rearranged alpha chain. So maybe you just need to amplify two or three times. But of course, you don't want too many of those, so you'd have restricted self-renewal there. Another is that maybe it's only partially rearranged at that point, and then you complete the rearrangement so you get more diversification if you make two or three copies of the partially rearranged beta chain. And another is that it's got absolutely nothing to do with controlling the beta chain rearrangement and it's purely a, about self-renewal just to, you know, make sure you've got enough T cells coming out of the system at the end. So I, I think we need to find a way and there's probable methods that we can use to actually get a sense for how the process of rearrangement is coincident with these different uh, phases of asymmetric division and self-renewal. Um, given that the starting size of the T cell has such a strong correlation with downstream fate, I mean, you, you presumably purified a population of naive T cells. Why do you think there are meaningful differences between them at all? And why are they different sizes? That's an interesting question. Um, why? Well, I mean, it could be as simple as, you know, you, you, want, you want diversity to get diverse responses, and so the cells specifically have uh, evolved to have heterogeneous cell size for that purpose. So does that mean uh, that your T cells have already made a fake decision? Yeah, that, that's the implication, yeah. Questions. I think I'll ask one question. So, so in the paddock assay, you have all the cells um, segregate, and, and so you likely look for, for for paddocks that have only a single cell. Yes. And so that's for practical reasons to enable cloning. Uh, sorry, tracking. Yes. Uh, so in vivo, when these things happen, they're a big mess. Yes. All interacting with each other. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, and given the, your correlation as you're doing, you'd almost predict that in fact um, the trajectory of the immunological response would be instant be insulated. So once a decision's made, it's going to go along its path. Yes. And what that path is depends on the cell at the beginning. So have you done any experiments to test that? So if you put two cells right. in a paddock or three cells in a paddock, yes. would, it, would it have an, um, uh, um, a predictable or would it induce a change in what yeah. you predict? Would be right. The the cell? right. No, we haven't tested that. It would not be that hard to test, so we probably should test that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, then it gets more complicated because it's things like, well, if there's multiple clones, they're all impacting on IL-2 availability, and so do you uh, change the concentrations yeah. of that to give them a chance to impact on each other in that yeah. way? Um, so yeah. it's, uh, it could get quite hairy, but I think it would be nice to do, yeah. Yeah, yeah, anyway. So. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah. I'll say again, remind the students, please come along to our talk. Thank you.